Eggs. Mr. Quincy. Yes, what is it? Is it true what you said about Joe Smith? Possibly, but it's also possible that I was misquoted. It is by no means improbable that some future textbook will contain a question something like this. What historical American of the 19th century has exerted the most powerful influence upon the destinies of his countrymen? The answer to that interrogatory may be thus written. Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet? You said that. The mayor of Boston said that Joseph Smith may be the most influential man of the 19th century? I said it. Now write this down. Joseph Smith, the Mormon prophet, has made himself at the age of 39 a power upon earth. His influence, whether it be for good or for evil, is potent today, and the end is not yet. The following program is made possible by the generous funding support of the Brent and Bonnie Jean Beasley Foundation, the Paul R. Willie Trust, the Joan and Tim Fenton Family Foundation, Bill and Rocille Lowe, Perry Holmes, Utah, the Stewart Charitable Foundations, the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation, the Olds Family Trust, the Sorensen Legacy Foundation, and Garfield and Margot Cook. Shortly after five o'clock on the afternoon of June 27, 1844, a mob craving its own frontier form of justice crept across an Illinois pasture, surrounded the jail at Carthage, and overpowered the guards. The militia, mustered to keep the peace, mounted no resistance. Attackers stormed up the stairs and swiftly fired shots into the second floor cell that housed the Mormon prophet Joseph Smith, his brother Hiram, and friends John Taylor and Willard Richard. The melee ended as quickly as it began. Joseph and Hiram are dead. Taylor wounded, not very badly. I am well. Our guard was forced, as we believe, by a band of 100 to 200. The job was done in an instant. Willard Richards. The bodies of the Smiths after the coroner's inquest were taken by my father, Artois Hamilton, to his hotel. He made boxes, not coffins, out of pine boards, which they were taken in to Nauvoo the next day. William Hamilton. Elihu Allen and I were working in the harvest field when about three o'clock, my wife came out and told us that Joseph Smith and his brother Hiram was shot in Carthage jail yesterday afternoon. I said at once that it cannot be so. We all felt as though the powers of darkness had overcome. Warren Foot. On the evening of the 27th of June, such a barking and howling of dogs and bellowing of cattle all over the city of Nauvoo I never heard before or since. I knelt down and tried to pray for the prophet, but I was struck speechless and knew not the cause till morning. Lucy Missouri Smith. When morning dawned, the news of the martyrdom of the two brothers reached the city. It can be well imagined the sorrow and darkness that seemed to pervade the whole place. Thousands of the saints were gathered on the main street to witness the sad and mournful arrival of our murdered prophet and patriarch, Maria Wealthy Wilcox. Not everyone grieved the loss of the 38-year-old religious leader. The money digger, the juggler, and the founder of the Golden Bible delusion has been hurried away in the midst of his madness to his final account. An outlaw himself, God cut him off by outlaws. Alexander Campbell, Millennial Harbinger. Smith was killed as he should have been. Three cheers to the brave company who shot him to pieces. 
Reverend William G. Brownlow, Jonesboro Whig. My mother and we children were in the living room in the mansion. Joseph. After leaning over the coffin, mother placed her hand upon the cheek of my father. Have they taken you from me at last? It's going to be all right, Mama. It's going to be all right. The Mormons had been stripped of their prophet and friend. How lonely was that feeling? How cold, barren, and desolate. As our prophet, he approached our God and obtained for us his will. But now our prophet, our counselor, our general, our leader, was gone. Joseph Smith was a nobody who became an unlikely uh, figure of importance in American religious history. I think Joseph Smith was a very charismatic man who was a genius in many respects, who had uh, sort of a brilliant sense of his own destiny and his own calling. He was someone who came from an impoverished, downwardly mobile family. I find it difficult to locate another individual in American history who was anything like Joseph Smith. This young prophet did not rise from the great New England universities or seminaries, nor did he preach from a pulpit of high acclaim. He was a farmer who lived on the edge of civilization, but at the center of a holy war that raged for years. He was a sharp-edged prophet. He wasn't refined. He spoke his mind. He was mirthful. He liked to laugh. He liked to wrestle. He didn't style himself as some holy man. He was very much down to earth even as he tried to span and bridge the distance between the heavens uh, and the earth. It's miraculous what he accomplished without formal education, without fortune. He had nothing but, but the Lord and the love of the people whom he led. Joseph Smith, Jr., a fifth-generation American, was born in Sharon, Vermont. We had a son whom we called Joseph after the name of his father. He was born December 23rd, 1805, Lucy Mack Smith. Joseph's mother described him as remarkably quiet, well disposed. He was the fourth son of 11 children, nine lived to adulthood. As the family moved and experienced the kind of oppression uh, and uh, sort of ill repute that they received from outsiders, it drew them even closer together. At age seven, Joseph fell victim to a typhoid epidemic. Complications of the fever infected his leg, requiring surgery to cut away portions of the diseased bone. Hiram sat beside Joseph almost day and night, holding the affected part of his leg in his hands and pressing it between them so that his afflicted brother he might be enabled to endure the pain. Hold fast, Joseph. Lucy Mack Smith. I think in those moments, Hiram and Joseph bound together in the most unusual way. The Smiths farmed the wooded hills of New England. They were poor. In 1816, after three crop failures in a row, they moved to Palmyra in the Finger Lakes district of upstate New York. Being in indigent circumstances, we were obliged to labor hard for the support of a large family. Suffice it to say, I was merely instructed in reading, writing, and the ground rules of arithmetic. Joseph Smith. Because we have all been living in sin! Nineteenth yes. century America was steeped in religious enthusiasm. Western New York in the early decades was so fired up with religious talk Historians later dubbed it the burned over district. Camps, revivals, street corners, and Sunday meetings were ablaze with believers, pushing orthodoxy aside. So it was a time of religious excitement, maybe even religious chaos. Established churches had gone by the wayside, so there was unprecedented religious freedom. It is a sign from above! Amen! Amen, Amen preacher! Amen. Amen. You know what I mean. And if you don't repent, you will be damned. My mind became seriously impressed with regard to the all-important concerns for the welfare of my immortal soul. 
great multitudes united themselves to the different religious parties, which created no small stir and division amongst the people. Some crying, lo here, and others, lo there. They knew not who was right or who was wrong, but considered it of the first importance to me that I should be right in matters involving eternal consequences. If you embrace wrong doctrines and unite with the corrupt church, you may expect coldness and darkness all your lives. Reverend William Bacon. Troubled by the confusion, 14-year-old Joseph said to his mother, I can take my Bible and go into the woods and learn more in two hours than you can learn at meeting in two years. Joseph turned to God for direction. On a spring day in 1820, he went to the woods near his home to pray. Thick darkness gathered around me, but exerting all my powers to call upon God to deliver me. I saw a pillar of light exactly over my head, above the brightness of the sun, which descended gradually until it fell upon me. When the light rested upon me, I saw two personages whose brightness and glory defy all description, standing above me in the air. One of them spake unto me, calling me by name, and said, pointing to the other, This is my beloved son. Hear him. And though I was hated and persecuted for saying that I had seen a vision, yet it was true. Did Joseph Smith believe that he had seen that vision? Of course he believed it. I mean, Joseph was severely persecuted and harassed for making that claim. He would have had to have been nuts to make that claim and stick with it if he didn't really believe that he had had that vision. Joseph later recounted that he asked the personages which of the churches he should join. Joseph tells his mother afterwards that Presbyterianism is not true. It's actually the only thing that he tells her about the vision in the official account. I belong to a Presbyterian church, so I don't especially believe that God the Father and Jesus Christ visited this young boy simply to tell him my church isn't true. Uh, but Joseph came from a visionary family. I think it's very reasonable to believe that he himself experienced a vision of God or of God and Jesus. You know, that very much fits his culture. They told me that all religious denominations were believing in incorrect doctrines and I was expressly commanded to go not after them, at the same time receiving a promise that the fullness of the gospel should at some future time be made known unto me. Joseph Smith. Joseph Smith claimed to have heard from God and to be communicating with God. And at its base, that is the definition of a prophet, someone who speaks for God. A few days later, Joseph confided in a local minister that he had seen a vision. I was greatly surprised at his behavior. He treated my communication not only lightly, but with great contempt, saying it was all of the devil. Why would this type of thing happen to a child of 14 years old? You know nothing of the Lord. That there were no such things as visions or revelations in these days, and that there never would be any more of them. I soon found that my telling the story had excited a great deal of prejudice against me among professors of religion. He didn't believe me. How could he not? And was the cause of great persecution, which continued to increase. Joseph Smith. I believe you. The fall of 1823 began years of unusual instruction for Joseph. A personage appeared at my bedside, standing in the air, for his feet did not touch the floor. He said there was a book deposited, written upon gold plates, giving an account of the former inhabitants of this continent, that the fullness of the everlasting gospel was contained in it as delivered by the Savior, Joseph Smith. Joseph described the figure as a prophet named Moroni, who once had lived in the Americas. 
Joseph spoke of being chastened, comforted, and prepared by Moroni to translate the ancient records then buried in a Drumlin hill near his home. Four years would pass before Joseph would be allowed to collect the gold plates. He called me by name and said unto me that he was a messenger sent from the presence of God to me, that God had a work for me to do. If I believed, I obviously would become a Mormon. But having said that, if we want to understand a tradition, we've got to take seriously what the representatives of that tradition tell us. What do I think is the significance of all these stories taken together? It's the heart of the Latter-day Saint restoration, the concern to recover direct communion with God. The Smiths were a close family. They stood by Joseph. In the years ahead, his parents and siblings would join the church he established and champion his call to work for God. Joseph continued to receive instructions from the Lord, and we continued to get the children together every evening for the purpose of listening while he gave us a relation of the same. I presume our family presented an aspect as singular as any that ever lived upon the face of the earth, all seated in a circle and giving the most profound attention to a boy, 18 years of age, who had never read the Bible through in his life, Lucy Mack Smith. Contrary to expectations and human experience, Joseph Smith's entire family was loyal to him from the beginning with his reciting the, the vision of the Father and the Son that set him on his prophetic course right through the end of his life. Do I personally believe? No. I have no evidence for that. And as a historian, I must base my conclusion on that. However, you can say, Look what he did. Is one human being capable of doing this without divine help and intervention? Joseph went to work to help support the family. Landowner and speculator Josiah Stoll hired him to search for Spanish treasure across the border in Pennsylvania. Well, it was very controversial in the 1820s to claim that one had the gift of finding buried treasure. Uh, Josiah Stowell uh, believed that Joseph had that gift. That's why he hired him. I think I dug my last hole, Josiah. We've been trying. After weeks of digging, right Joseph right persuaded Stowell to give it up. But the quest in the foothills near Harmony was not without reward. Boarding at the home of Isaac Hale, Joseph fell in love with the tall, hazel-eyed daughter, Emma. Joseph, do you come from a large family? Yes. Young Smith asked my consent to his marrying my daughter, Emma. This I refused and gave him my reasons for so doing, some of which were that he was a stranger and followed a business that I could not approve. Isaac Hale. Joseph urged me to marry him and preferring to marry him to any other man I knew. I consented. Emma Smith. The two eloped January 18, 1827, and moved north to live with Joseph's parents near Palmyra. Late on a September night, Joseph and Emma borrowed a rig, slipped into the dark, and headed for the hill Camorra, three miles from the Smith family home. It was the appointed time to meet with the angel Moroni. According to Joseph, at that rendezvous, he obtained the ancient records. They were engraven on plates, which had the appearance of gold. Each plate was six inches wide and eight inches long, and not quite as thick as common tin. They were filled with engravings in Egyptian characters and bound together in a volume as the leaves of a book, with three rings running through the whole. The volume was something near six inches in thickness. Word that Joseph had plates of gold created a frenzy in the community. Joseph said the angel told him to show the ancient records to no one. People came in to see them, but he told them they could not, for he must not show them. But many insisted and offered money and property to see them. 
but for keeping them from the people, they persecuted and abused the Smiths, and they were obliged to hide them. Joseph Knight, Sr. gentlemen. You Joe Smith? Smith? I am. For safekeeping, he stashed the gold plates in a handful of places, under the hearthstones in the Smith home, the loft of his father's about. cooper shop, even in a barrel of beans. Finally, Joseph and Emma took the plates and left New York. A prominent farmer and benefactor, Martin Harris, financed their exit to Emma's family home in Pennsylvania. The couple lived in a small log house, enjoying some measure of comfort and privacy, two things they would live without in years to come. The plates lay in a box under our bed for months, but I never felt at liberty to look at them. Emma Smith. Whether he had golden plates that spoke to him and gave him that story, or whether he made it up on his own, I have no doubt that it was sort of the powers of his creative imagination that helped to bring about the Book of Mormon. When Joseph began translating the record, Emma served as his scribe, as did Martin and others. He would dictate to me hour after hour. And when returning after meals or after interruptions, he would at once begin where he left off without either seeing the manuscript or having any portion of it read to him. Believe in God, believe that he is, that he created all things. This was a regular thing for him to do. Emma Smith. Oliver Cowdery, a young school teacher boarding with the Smiths in New York, was intrigued by the family's account of Joseph and his translation work. Mr. Smith, Cowdery, sir, Oliver Cowdery. I understand you're in need of a scribe. Oliver Cowdery. <laughs> It's so nice to finally meet you. He journeyed to wow, Pennsylvania to learn more from Joseph and quickly became an ally and scribe. Each day he would get up and put those plates on the table, but not unwrap them. Then he would sit there and look at a stone, which he put in a hat to kind of exclude the light as if he were seeing something on it, and then just dictate. And someone would be there to write it down. Always there was some kind of a physical instrument to facilitate the translation. Oliver, will you read that back to me, please? These were days never to be forgotten. To sit under the voice dictated by the inspiration of heaven awakened the utmost gratitude of this bosom. Day after day I continued, uninterrupted, to write from his mouth as he translated the history or record called the Book of Mormon. Oliver Cowdery. Emma Smith frequently observed the Book of Mormon translation process. Her descriptions include the statement that before he translated the Book of Mormon, Joseph could not write or dictate a well-worded letter. And then suddenly, out of this unlikely background, appears a 584-page book, complex book, that was so incongruous for the people around him they couldn't believe he could have written it himself. Others assisted Joseph in his translation work by providing food and supplies. Good day, Emma. Good day, Mr. Knight. We have brought you provisions. But Joseph had little time to farm his makeshift homestead on the Susquehanna River. I bought a barrel of mackerel and some lined paper for writing, nine to 10 bushels of grain and five or six bushels of taters and a pound of tea. And I went down to see him, and they were in want. Joseph Knight, Sr. While translating the plates, Joseph encountered passages about baptism which sparked his and Oliver's curiosity. Who had the authority to baptize? They broke from translating and went down to the river to pray about their question. They later related that an angel, John the Baptist, appeared and gave them the priesthood of Aaron. Not long after, they described receiving additional priesthood power. Joseph Smith, Jr. Immediately, on our coming up out of the water after we had been baptized, we experienced great and glorious blessings from our Heavenly Father. 
I prophesied concerning the rise of this church and many other things connected with the church and this generation of the children of men. Joseph Smith. We're here today to discuss a few occurrences in our community. To many, Joseph's efforts were more than peculiar. They were intolerable, a ruse. So we're going to address that. When some of the locals converted to the new faith, the town fathers Mr. sought Smith to blunt Joseph's influence by having him brought to trial as a disorderly person. Community, what say you? Well, sir, I respectfully protest my innocence. To the contrary, Your Honor. We declare Joseph's innocence with the same respect you've accorded us. None. Joseph was brought to trial in order to check the progress of the delusion and open the eyes and understanding of those who blindly followed him. A.W. Benton. It is true. I have seen a vision. And I've made no secret of it in this community. If sharing this truth has stirred up controversy, then so be it. These arrests and prosecutions were among the first of the nearly 50 arraignments to which he was forced to submit. Not once. During all these court trials, was he proven guilty of any crime, for he was a law-abiding citizen. John Reed, Esquire. You're free to go, Mr. Smith. Joseph took the plates to safety, this time to the home of Peter and Mary Whitmer in Fayette, New York. Here, from April to July of 1829, the young prophet finished the translation. I can't describe the process of translating the book by an unschooled person because I don't know of, of any one that's ever done it, except for Joseph Smith, who said he did it with a, with a gift and power of God. The Book of Mormon mocks the idea that there would only be one Bible, it says there will be lots of Bibles. Most Americans found that idea outlandish. It has enormous appeal to people who want to hear directly from God once again, as opposed to simply reading a text that comes to us out of the first century or the or previous centuries, as in the Hebrew Bible. The plates were shown for the first time to a handful of men who would act as witnesses. Though these men later broke with Joseph, not one ever denied what he saw. Be it known unto all nations, kindreds, tongues, and people, unto whom this work shall come, that we have seen the plates. Oliver Cowdery. David Whitmer. Martin Harris. Eight other men and one woman reported seeing the plates before they were taken back by Moroni. The plates of Moroni. I feel as if I was relieved of a burden which was almost too heavy for me to bear. And it rejoices my soul that I am not any longer to be entirely alone in the world. Joseph Smith. The fact that they could see the angel, they could touch the plates, they could turn the leaves, meant that they could be independent witnesses, which he surely had longed to have. They believed in the Book of Mormon to their deaths. They believed in Joseph having been called of God and receiving authority to their deaths. But for personal reasons, sometimes for community reasons, they dropped out along the way. 5,000 copies of the Book of Mormon were printed in 1829 by Egbert B. Grandin of Palmyra, New York. Martin Harris mortgaged his farm to pay the $3,000 bill. Joseph described the book, nearly 600 pages in its first printing, as the keystone of the new religion. I told the brethren that the Book of Mormon was the most correct of any book on earth and a man would get nearer to God by abiding by its precepts than by any other book. There were other would-be prophets who reported visions of God or visions of God and Jesus. Joseph Smith had a nearly 600-page work of ancient scripture to present to his followers as proof that God spoke to them uh, through a new prophet. For a Bible-believing public, in a public that is captivated both by this new world on the one hand and by Jesus on the other, a book that says Jesus preached here in this new world, that's something a lot of people would have wanted to read. Upon hearing of the Book of Mormon, many accepted it as the word of God 
and as a witness of Jesus Christ. I arose from its perusal with a strong conviction on my mind that its pages were graced with the pen of inspiration. Reverend Orson Spencer. The Book of Mormon vaulted Joseph to national attention. His followers were soon called Mormons. The book had its detractors. Some could not accept Joseph as its translator. Some claimed the text was borrowed from other sources, was crafted by more learned associates, or simply was a product of his imagination. No small stir was created by its appearance. Joseph Smith. Mormonism had a peculiar powerful combination of doctrines that was very appealing. The doctrine that Christ is coming soon and he's setting up his kingdom and uh, the sense that we're establishing the kingdom of God on earth. So once people were in it, they're not just passive observers, they're enmeshed in it. It's a whole culture. On April 6, 1830, just weeks after the Book of Mormon went on sale in the Palmyra bookstore, Joseph formally organized a church. The 50 or so men and women in attendance at the Whitmer farm accepted name. him as a seer, a translator, a prophet of Jesus Christ. Church membership would jump from hundreds to thousands in the next few years as news of a restored religion and word of its doctrine spread. I step forth into the field to tell you what the Lord is doing and what you must do to enjoy the smiles of your Savior in these last days. Joseph Smith. The young church grew quickly. Missionaries headed east to the New England states, north to Canada, their satchels filled with copies of the Book of Mormon. Missions lasted weeks, months, and as the church grew, even years. A few were directed west to preach to the Indians. The missionaries found residents in Kirtland, Ohio, particularly receptive. Thousands flocked about us daily, some to be taught, some for curiosity, some to obey the gospel, and some to dispute it or resist it. Parley P. Pratt. The Spirit of the Lord sensibly attended the ministration, and I came out of the water rejoicing and singing praises to God and the Lamb. John Murdoch. The church was not conceived as a means of simply spreading the word about the Book of Mormon. The new faith issued a call for all to come back to Christ. That position gave voice to new antagonism. The greatest imposter of our times in the field of religion is no doubt a certain Joseph Smith. I think the main reason for opposition to Mormonism, especially in, in its first 15 years, was the church's principle and doctrine of gathering. Joseph Smith did not intend for individuals to convert to his movement or to join his church and then stay where they were and worship in local churches. As Methodists or Presbyterians or Lutherans might have worshiped. He called on his followers to leave everything behind and gather together to be a united people. A wonderful ideal, a demanding ideal, but very threatening to other Americans. Instead of dispersing, the church grew. In December 1830, Joseph pronounced what he said was a revelation from God that commanded the faithful as the latter-day hosts of Israel to gather in Kirtland, Ohio. At his call, a steady stream of church members from Fayette, Colesville, and Manchester, New York, packed up and moved west. Joseph arrived in Kirtland later that winter. Bundled inside the sleigh was Emma, six months pregnant. A few months later, twins Thaddeus and Louisa were born. They died at birth, as had Alvin, the Smith's first son. How can this be?
I have a surprise for you. Within weeks, Joseph and Emma had adopted twins Joseph and Julia Murdoch, whose mother had died in childbirth. Of the nine children Emma bore, only four lived to maturity. Life was never easy for the Smiths. They rarely had a home of their own. Emma, when she did have a place, took in boarders to supplement their income. Dear Joseph, I still believe that if we humble ourselves and are as faithful as we can be, we shall be delivered from every snare that may be laid for our feet. Thank you, Matt. Emma Smith. In the next 15 years, thousands would change their lives, their professions, leave homes and even families to follow the prophet Joseph. They came in every conceivable manner some with horses, oxen, and vehicles rough and rude, while others had walked all or part of the distance. The future city of the saints appeared like one besieged. Every available house, shop, hut, or barn was filled to its utmost capacity. Gayaga County Recorder. They were asked to do something different. It would take them out of their current way of life. So this was a big commitment. It wasn't a matter of just going to church, you know, on Sunday and doing some uh, good deeds now and then and contributing to the church. This made people put their lives on the line. When wagon loads of grown people and children came in from the country to meet him, Joseph would make his way to as many of the wagons as he could and cordially shake hands with each person. He loved innocence and purity. Nice to meet you. Louisa Y. Littlefield. Long journey. In Kirtland, Joseph pictured more than a bustling city. He envisioned a community of good people focused on righteous principles and helping one another. He called the people saints. And a lot of what drove him was that sense of creating a better world, a world where the poor have what they need, a world of cooperation, a world of education, something that he had not had but sought his entire life. Joseph taught that care for the poor and needy was part of the process of making saints. He instituted a sharing of resources among the members to care for the stream of converts coming into Kirtland. Now for a man to consecrate his property to the Lord, is nothing more nor less than to feed the hungry, clothe the naked, visit the widow and fatherless, the sick and afflicted, and for him and his house to serve the Lord. Joseph Smith. He was a man without any political or administrative experience. He was a man without money. He struggled to support his family throughout his life. He was a man uh, with no background to lead one to believe that he'd be able to found a church, establish a doctrinal foundation, assemble remarkable people to be leaders in that church, send missionaries to different corners of the earth, and lead the church from one place to another under immense persecution. Local authorities charged that the town was being burdened by an insupportable weight of pauperism and ordered the Mormons to leave. The vice of Mormonism must be accounted one of the most palpable and widespread delusions which this country has ever seen. Truman Co. Merchants boycotted Mormon businesses, even refused to grind their grain. But their efforts did not stem Mormon immigration, nor did it arrest the zeal of the faithful. We began to talk about the kingdom of God as if we had the whole world at our command. When God sets up a system of salvation, he sets up a system of government that shall rule over temporal and spiritual affairs. Sidney Rigdon. Joseph's next step in unfolding the new religion was to build another community in Independence, Missouri, what was then the farthest fringe of America. God designated the very spot upon which he designed to commence the work of the gathering and the building up of an holy city which should be called Zion. And all who build thereon are to worship the true and living God. 
Joseph Smith. They went by wagon, canal boat, stage, and steamer, walking the final stretch to independence. For the next seven years, Joseph and other church leaders would shuttle the nearly 900 miles between the two settlements. Missouri represented more space, more land. Missouri represented a place to uh, carry out Joseph Smith's visions on a grander scale. Um, there were already signs, though, that Kirtland was not meant to be the stopping point for the church. The Mormons did not mix well in the independent culture of the frontier. They believed the land had been given to them by God. They preached to the Indians. They held no slaves. They shared their resources rather than trading with the locals. Such practices enraged their neighbors. When hundreds of Mormons came and settled in the region, the others could see the handwriting on the wall. They feared being tyrannized by Mormons once Mormons became the majority and they determined to drive them out before that happened. Vigilante actions began. There were some burning of homes, destruction of a Mormon printing press, tarring and feathering. Opposition was mounting in Ohio as well. As quickly as some joined the church, they left. These dissenters took issue with the way the prophet unfolded the new faith and its church practices. Folks who became disillusioned for one reason or another with Joseph Smith or with the Latter-day Saints and couldn't let it alone, but used their disillusionment to try and stir up trouble. And that was often quite successful. To distance themselves from the conflict, the Smiths moved in with the Johnson family in nearby Hiram. But the quiet of the farm was quickly shattered. We'd have a word with you. <laughs> Joseph! Call out to your God for help. No. You will receive no mercy. No, let him go. Let him go. On a March night, 1832, a mob dragged Joseph and Sidney Rigdon from their beds to a nearby field, beat them, tarred and feathered their bodies, and tried to force poison down Joseph's throat. Rip his shirt off! Yeah, there we go! Get out of there! Joseph staggered home, presenting a terrifying sight at the door. Seeing Joseph coated with what she thought was blood, Emma fainted. Emma, 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 please, no. With my flesh all scarified and defaced, I preached to the congregation as usual Sunday, and in the afternoon of the same day, baptized three individuals. Joseph's friends indicated that some of the men in the assembly that morning had been in the mob the night before. Follow after peace. As our beloved brother Paul said, that you may be the children of our Heavenly Father. You know no more concerning the destinies of this church and kingdom than a babe upon its mother's lap. You don't comprehend it. But this church will fill North and South America. It will fill the world. I find Joseph Smith uh, a remarkable person. He had a charisma that is undeniable, I think, and had a vision for a community that um, it was unlike anything else that's ever been created. So as a historian, I'm interested in how that comes about. How is it that certain people um, can gain that kind of affection and respect from other people, and also the kind of denunciations he, he received at the same time? Amid the tumult, Joseph was pronouncing what he said were revelations from God to direct the church and its people. 
Joseph declared it was an awful responsibility to write in the name of the Lord. Joseph also claimed that by revelation, he was revising parts of the King James Bible. He contended important points touching the salvation of man had been taken or lost from the Bible before it was compiled. You know, in the early 19th century, there were many Americans who thought that the church, either the Protestant church or the Catholic church, or probably both, uh, had gotten a little too uh, encrusted with all kinds of traditions and bureaucracies. And the focus for early 19th century evangelicals was to read the Bible and interpret it for yourself. And when you read the Bible, you start to believe in the need to return to something purer, something uh, closer to what Jesus would have put on the earth. That's restoration. Joseph Smith's view of restoration is to recover the entire biblical legacy. All of the powers are to be brought into the modern world, including the temple, the center of Israelitish worship. In December 1832, following the pattern of biblical times, Joseph announced the building of a temple. He said it had been revealed to him that it was to be a house of prayer, a house of fasting, a house of faith, a house of God. Its construction would make it possible for the saints to be what Joseph called endowed with power from on high. The temple cost about $50,000, a great sacrifice for a people sharing their food to stay alive. Come, brethren, let us go into the stone quarry and work for the Lord. Nothing was spared in the effort. When Joseph outlined what was needed in terms of skill and artistry, Heber C. Kimball said he knew someone who could do the job, but the man lived in Canada Joseph. and was not a member of the church. Joseph dispatched Brigham Young to convert Artemis Millet and then bring him to Kirtland. He added that Millet should also bring $1,000 to assist with the project. Weeks later, Brigham, Artemis, and the money arrived in Kirtland. Secured for the temple. There was but one mainspring to all our thoughts and actions. God bless you. Bless you, Brother Joseph. And that was the building of the Lord's house. Lucy Mack Smith. From the very earliest revelations in New York, there was a promise of power from on high if they moved to Ohio, but it came very soon to be connected with power from God on high in temples. They believed that until they had this endowment of power, they would, could not realize all their potentialities as a church. This temple in Kirtland was to be a place that would be a launching pad the endowment of power, then go out into the world to preach the gospel. Through the winter of 1836, saints labored to complete the temple despite hostility from the disaffected members and militant townspeople. One worker described holding the sword in one hand, the trowel in the other. That March, they completed the temple and held special services in the new edifice. Joseph told the saints that the Lord would appear and accept his house and the sacrifice of the people. The temple was filled with angels, which fact I declared to the congregation. The people of the neighborhood came running together and seeing a bright light like a pillar of fire resting upon the temple, and were astonished at what was taking place. Joseph Smith. Look, there's a meeting up there. A little girl came to my door and in wonder called me out, exclaiming, the meeting is on the top of the meeting house. I went to the door, and there I saw on the temple angels clothed in white, covering the roof from end to end. Presendia Huntington. Some historians that have gathered up the stories of spiritual or heavenly manifestations around the dedication of the Kirtland Temple have seen it as one of the best documented instances of miracles in the history of the Latter-day Saint movement. Heavenly glory associated in some fashion with the temple was such that even the neighbors in the community were aware that something very strange was going on at the Kirtland Temple. When God intervenes in human history, and those events 
are always controversial. They seem beyond the realm of human experience. Three days later, Joseph and Oliver prayed with their fellow saints in the temple. Joseph opened the meeting by prayer. Never until then had I heard a man address his maker as though he was present listening. Daniel Tyler. In contrast to the outpouring of spiritual jubilation came challenges to Joseph and his work from disenchanted factions. Among the defectors were apostles, witnesses to the Book of Mormon, and members who had at one time praised his name. Joseph Smith had a vision, and some folks agreed with that vision, caught the vision, endorsed it, worked for it. Others were repelled by it. Defections did not deter Joseph. He wrote that God revealed to me that something new must be done for the salvation of his children. Joseph asked trusted friend and apostle Heber C. Kimball to go to England on a mission to preach the gospel. I felt my weakness and was nearly ready to sink under it. But the moment I understood the will of my heavenly father, I felt a determination to go at all hazards. Heber C. Kimball. At 10 a.m. on July 30th, 1837, they baptized nine members. When I heard of it, it gave me great joy. Joseph Smith. Within eight months, 2,000 British citizens had joined the new church. To finance some of the needs of the burgeoning church and community, Joseph and his advisors had established a bank named the Kirtland Safety Society. When the state of Ohio denied the charter in February 1837, the bank's notes became worthless. Many in Kirtland blamed Joseph and joined a growing chorus calling him a fallen prophet. The enemy abroad and apostates in our midst united in their schemes, and many became disaffected toward me as though I were the sole cause of those very evils I was most strenuously striving against. Joseph Smith. Joseph was trying to build a community. That involved him in temple affairs. It involved him in business, ultimately in debt. And a lot of folks felt that somehow these temporal engagements were not worthy of a prophet. The challenge, I think, for a prophet is that one's prophecies might be perfect, might be sacred, but one is still a human being. And for some people, Joseph could do no wrong. Other people thought that their prophet had moved away from that. And they believed that there could be a distinction made between his prophecies and his role as a human being. A new year dawned upon the church in Kirtland in all the bitterness of the spirit of apostate mobocracy, which continued to rage and grow hotter and hotter until Elder Rigdon and myself were obliged to flee from its deadly influence, as did the apostles and prophets of old. Joseph Smith. The faithful trail behind. That summer, a mile-long wagon train moved slowly out of Kirtland and headed for Missouri. Hundreds of saints left behind their temple, their businesses, their farms. Some left family as they followed Joseph to the farthest edge of America. What the Lord will do with us, I know not. Although he slay me, I will trust in him. We are like the ancients wandering from place to place in the wilderness. John Smith. As Kirtland refugees and new converts poured into far west and surrounding communities, the population swelled to more than 5,000. 4,900 were Mormon. This is where we will build the house of the Lord. Latter-day Saints definitely did consider themselves to be God's chosen people. They were exclusivists, meaning that they saw their faith as the only true church on the earth. So to have an organized, or what looked to be an organized and large group of people moving into communities uh, en masse seemed to many other people like a threat to their own way of life and to their independence on the frontier. War clouds began again to lower with dark and threatening aspect. Those who had combined against the laws in the adjoining counties had long watched our increasing power and prosperity with jealousy. It was a common boast that 
As soon as we had completed our extensive improvements and made a plentiful crop, they would drive us from the state and once more enrich themselves with the spoil. Harley P. Pratt. The mobs began to gather in various places and commence their hostilities, so much so that we were obliged to shoulder our guns and stand guard night and day. Joseph Horn. Our plowshares have been turned into swords, and the Mormon War is the all-engrossing topic of conversation. Even politics is submerged in the deafening sound of the drum and the din of arms. The Jeffersonian Republican. In late October, Missouri Governor Boggs issued an extermination order which authorized the militia to increase its force and operate against the Mormons. The Mormons must be treated as enemies and must be exterminated or driven from the state, if necessary, for the public good. Their outrages are beyond all description. Lilburn Boggs, Governor, Missouri. Mormon leaders served notice that if the law would not protect them, they would protect themselves. We have not only when spitting on one cheek turned the other, but we have done it again and again until we are wearied of being smitten. That mob that comes on us to disturb us, it shall be between us and them a war of extermination. Governor Lilburn Boggs issued what became known as the extermination order, that the Mormons had to leave Missouri or face extermination. A remarkable order uh, given by a sitting American governor against the members of a religious group. Latter-day Saints were barred from voting in Gallatin, which led to altercations at other Mormon communities. The outpost at Hans Mill was pillaged, and 17 Saints were brutally gunned down. The farms and homes burned, women assaulted. Among the opposition's forces were former Mormon faithful who had crossed over to join Missourians. Joseph Smith, Sidney Rigdon, Parley P. Pratt, and others were lured to a peace conference only to be arrested and dragged to jail. Ain't nothing to talk about. Missouri Militia General Samuel D. Lucas, acting under authority of the governor, ordered the prisoners shot in the morning. Captain. General. I have a letter for you from General Clark. In response to your request, to have the prisoners released. Do not let it enter your mind that you will see their faces again. General Lucas, for whatever reasons, was among those who thought that Joseph Smith didn't deserve to live, that if we killed him, we could get rid of the Mormon menace finally forever. By order of the governor, the prisoners are to be shot in the morning. I will not obey your order. Alexander Donovan, the militia officer charged with the execution, defied the order. And if these men are executed, I will hold you responsible before an earthly tribunal. So help me, God. The prisoners were shuttled from courtrooms to jail cells, first to Independence, then to Richmond, and finally to Liberty. Joseph and his fellow captives were denied common courtesies, fed filthy food, and exposed to freezing temperatures. Dear Joseph, rolling rivers, running streams, rising hills, sinking valleys, and spreading prairies that separate us, places my feelings far beyond description. But I still live, and am yet willing to suffer more if it is the will of heaven that I should for your sake. Emma Smith. Dear Emma, I very well know your toils and sympathize with you. If God will spare my life once more to have the privilege of taking care of you, I will ease your care and endeavor to comfort your heart. The guards in the Richmond jail taunted the prisoners with curses and boasts of raping and murdering the Mormons. Finally, Joseph rose to his feet and rebuked them. Silence, ye fiends of the infernal pit! In the name of Jesus Christ, I rebuke you and command you to be still. I will not live another minute and hear such language. Cease such talk or you, or I die this instant. Chained and without a weapon, 
Calm, unruffled, and dignified as an angel, Joseph looked upon the quailing guards, whose knees smote together, and who, shrinking into a corner, begged his pardon and remained quiet until a change of guard. I cannot conscience such evil, brother. I have seen the ministers of justice clothed in magisterial robes, and criminals arraigned before them in the courts of England. I have witnessed a Congress in solemn session to give laws to nations. I have tried to conceive of kings, of royal courts, of thrones and crowns. But dignity and majesty I have seen but once, as it stood in chains at midnight in a dungeon in an obscure village in Missouri. Parley P. Pratt. Joseph was in jail, his future uncertain. Rather than dispersing the core of Latter-day Saints, followed Brigham Young in a ragged retreat from Missouri to Illinois and safety. Dear Joseph, no one knows but God the feelings of my heart when I left our house and home, leaving you shut up in that lonesome prison. I hope there are better days to come to us yet. Emma Smith. Emma not only got herself and her children across 200 miles of Missouri and across the Mississippi River to Quincy. She had the presence of mind and the fortitude to bring some of Joseph's most treasured papers with her. And you see Emma uh, on her own as the resilient, strong, dedicated woman she was. Joseph, Hiram, and the handful of friends were confined for the winter in Liberty Jail. Certainly the name did not suit their conditions. Below their cell was a dark, damp cellar a dungeon of sorts where they were forced to spend their days. Cold seeped through the walls, and there was no bedding. When Joseph wrote Emma asking for a blanket, she replied that the mob had stripped their quarters of all they had, including the quilts. Oh God, where art thou? And where is the pavilion that covereth thy hiding place? How long shall thy hand be stayed? Joseph Smith. Joseph described the answer to his pleadings as a revelation from God with these words. Thine adversity and thine affliction shall be but a small moment. And then if thou endure it well, God shall exalt thee on high. Thou shalt triumph over all thy foes. Thy friends do stand by thee and they shall hail thee again with warm hearts and friendly hands. One of those friends was his brother Hiram. Hiram knew that Joseph was a prophet, and I th think probably he counted it a privilege to stand by such a faithful brother. I could pray in my heart that all my brethren were like unto my beloved brother Hiram, for truly he possesses the mildness of a lamb and the integrity of Job and in short, the meek and quiet spirit of Jesus Christ. And I love him with that love that is stronger than death. Joseph Smith. I had been abused and thrust into a dungeon and confined for months on account of my faith and the testimony of Jesus Christ. However, I thank God that I felt a determination to die rather than deny the things which my eyes had seen which my hands had handled, and which I had borne testimony to, wherever my lot had been cast. Hiram Smith. Mama! After almost half a year in jail, the prisoners were granted a change of venue. They had been held illegally with no official sentencing. The guards during the transfer were careless, perhaps purposely, allowing the prisoners to bolt. We thought it a favorable opportunity to make our escape. I cried, Lord, what will you have me to do? The answer was, build up a city and call my saints to this place. Joseph Smith's experience in prison was transformational. This is a Joseph who has thought through the lessons the Lord would have him learn. And when he comes out, he has a different mindset about what his priorities are 
and he goes about it a little different way. Most of what then follows has to do in some way with the temple. And he knew when he left jail, his time was short. Joseph again took up his cause born years before in an illuminated grove in New York. He purchased a sparsely settled swampland on the Mississippi and named it Nauvoo, Hebrew for beautiful city. The Illinois legislature granted a liberal city charter giving broad authority to the new colony. For a time, the saints found respite from their persecutors, but they immediately faced illness and disease. Many lay sick along the bank of the river. Joseph healed all the sick that lay in his path. Among the number was Henry G. Sherwood, who was nigh unto death. Brother Sherwood. Joseph stood in the door of his tent and commanded him in the name of Jesus Christ to arise and come out of his tent. And he obeyed him and was healed. Wilfred Woodruff. New members converted in the growing missionary effort in England, Canada, and the Eastern States started pouring into Nauvoo. I could see one person who towered away and above all the others around. The one thought that filled my soul was, I have seen the prophet of God, Emmeline Blanche Wells. Nauvoo developed quickly, becoming the largest city in the state. Before long, the Mormons made up half the population of Hancock County. Joseph laid out the city, reserving the bluff overlooking the Mississippi for a temple. It is expected to be considerably larger than the one in Kirtland, and on a more magnificent scale. If it should be the will of God that I might live to behold that temple, completed and finished from the foundation to the top stone, I will say, O oh Lord, it is enough. Lord, let thy servant depart in peace. Joseph Smith. In anticipation of the temple's completion, Joseph administered to a selected few sacred priesthood rites. He also united families, husbands, wives, and children in a ceremony he promised was binding for all eternity. He called it sealing. Joseph said this holy work to join heaven and earth had been revealed to him by God. Whatsoever you seal on earth shall be sealed in heaven and whatsoever you bind on earth, in my name and by my word, it shall be eternally bound in the heavens. Joseph Smith. Joseph had revealed to them blessings that could only be given to the membership of the church in a dedicated house of Lord. In our church, we have marriage for time and for all eternity, where we're sealed by the power of the priesthood, husband to wife, wife to husband, children to parents. He taught me many great and glorious principles concerning God and the heavenly order of eternity. It was from him that I learned that the wife of my bosom might be secured to me for time and all eternity. Polly P. Pratt. As an expansion of his teaching that marriage could last through the eternities, Joseph introduced a few trusted friends to the added concept of a plurality of wives as practiced by Abraham and other ancient prophets. What he termed the new and everlasting covenant included both monogamous marriage and plural marriage. Joseph was also sealed to more than one wife. It seemed to be part of a restoration of all dispensations of time. So he thought of himself very much in succession of line of prophetic voices going back to Abraham. Joseph testified to closest friends that it became a priority not because he was ready or wanted to, but because an angel had come and said, it can no longer be delayed, it is your responsibility, you must do this or someone else will be raised up to do it. It mattereth not whether the principle is popular or unpopular. I will always maintain a true principle even if I stand alone in it. Joseph Smith. The plural marriage aspect sparked accusations of carnal lust, 
and heightened antagonism against the Mormons. Even some Mormons were troubled. I was not desirous of shrinking from any duty, nor of failing the least to do as I was commanded. But it was the first time in my life that I had desired the grave, and I could hardly get over it for a long time. And when I saw a funeral, I felt to envy the corpse its situation, and to regret that I was not in the coffin. Brigham Young. It was the most reckless and dangerous uh, innovation that Joseph Smith introduced. Uh, it's something that caused a great deal of hurt uh, to his own wife, Emma. Part of restoring the gospel means restoring everything. Everything. What does that mean? The Lord has commanded me to, to live the law of marriage in the way the prophets of old have, taking on another wife. He counted the cost with Emma, with the family, with the church, his own life, and ultimately decided that he would carry out to the best of his ability the command of the angel, the command of the Lord. Well, if we trust that these people had their own motivations and they weren't evil motivations, what is it that they saw that they would gain from this? It's very clear to me in looking at what Joseph Smith was doing with plural marriage, what people often call polygamy, was tying people together in these kinship units. His aim was to link people into a great network of families. After he died, there were people who were sealed to him as children, as well as women who were sealed to him as wives after he's dead, in order to create this great family network. It was my privilege to meet with Brother Joseph. He counseled the sisters present not to be troubled in consequence of this law that many would be called to live, that all would be right, and the result would be for their glory and exaltation. Bathsheba Smith. In Nauvoo, every account that I have seen of a man or a woman who encountered plural marriage were faced with a tremendous faith-shattering dilemma. Is Joseph indeed still a prophet? Could the Lord command this of him or demand this of me? And each one tells his or her story of how they came to grips with it and gained their own conviction that however difficult it was, it was indeed required. The fact that Emma, when she left Missouri, along with her four children, was willing to carry with her Joseph Smith's translation of the Bible means that she was fully committed. She was in for this adventure wherever it took them. In some ways, I think the hardships can either uh, you know, make one want to flee or can make one more committed. And in her case, I think she was fully committed to staying with Joseph and to seeing this through. Joseph held most of the posts of influence in Nauvoo. In addition to his religious role, he was the mayor, chief justice, lieutenant general of the Nauvoo Legion, publisher and regent of the university. The prophet had a great many callers or visitors, doctors, lawyers, priests, and people seemed anxious to get a good look at what was then considered something very wonderful, a man who should dare to call himself a prophet. I could clearly see that Joseph was the captain no matter whose company he was in. Howard Corey. I never wanted him to go into the garden to work, for if he did, it would not be 15 minutes before there would be three or four, or sometimes a half a dozen men round him, and they would tramp the ground down faster than he could hoe it up. Emma Smith. While Joseph's popularity grew among his people, so did the animosity of his enemies. Newspaper claims that Nauvoo may soon outrival any city in the West, no doubt angered sponsors of competing communities. Should the inherent corruption of Mormonism fail to develop sufficiently to convince its followers of their error, where will the thing end? The New York Sun. The positive thing about Joseph Smith is that he was transparent and he left a record, including notably the Book of Mormon that he gave to the world, 
He had his enemies, but the people that knew him well loved him and stood by him. Reading the last three months of Joseph's journal, one cannot escape the sense of events spiraling out of control. There were so many dissenters who were arrayed against him that it almost began to seem inevitable that something tragic was going to happen. In Illinois, as in Ohio and Missouri, anger and resentment festered at first and then gathered strength. Residents from neighboring communities met in Carthage in the fall of 1843 to voice their grievances regarding what they called the pretended prophet of the Lord. Such an individual cannot fail to become a most dangerous character, especially when he shall have been able to place himself at the head of a numerous horde, equally reckless and unprincipled as himself. Edson Whitney, Carthage Committee. This deluded, fanatical, and ignorant sect is about to be poured upon us by thousands and thus, like the locusts of Egypt, consume every green thing in the land and wither away, so far as they can, every vestige of godliness. Reverend B.F. Morris, Warsaw Signal. Public passion accelerated in early summer 1844 as the anti-Mormons banded with the Mormon defectors, some of them former members of Joseph's inner circle. Joe Smith is not safe out of Nauvoo. We would not be surprised to hear of his death by violent means in a short time. He has deadly enemies. On June 7th, the dissidents printed their first and only issue of the Nauvoo Expositor. Its columns accused Joseph of being one of the blackest and basest scoundrels that has appeared upon the stage of human existence, and his followers hell-deserving, God-forsaken villains. Nauvoo City Council retaliated by declaring the newspaper and its printing office a public nuisance and ordering the press destroyed. In the eyes of many of the people who lived around Nauvoo and the dissidents who lived within the city, that was seen as nothing less than a violation of their First Amendment freedom of speech and their right to, to publish. Were those who were just waiting for something to happen that they could use as a pretense for murder. Mayor Joseph Smith declared martial law, but animosity had flared beyond the borders of his influence. Illinois Governor Thomas Ford intervened, issued an arrest warrant, and ordered Joseph to turn himself in at Carthage, the Hancock County seat. Joseph at first refused. Governor Ford gave him lip service, but couldn't control many of the people around them, couldn't control the posses, the vigilantes that were, were already clearly um, had it out for Joseph Smith. There were rumors of conspiracies against his life. Of course, he'd had that before, but these seemed a little more substantial. Hiram and Joseph were the face of the Mormon problem as the anti-Mormons saw it. There was some thought that if Joseph and Hiram gave themselves up, the city would be safe. Be good. Raids on outlying Mormon settlements fed the discord. Fearing that mobs would next fall upon Nauvoo, Joseph, Hiram, and some close friends began the 26-mile journey to Carthage to submit to the latest warrants. When Joseph finally made the decision to leave Nauvoo and go to Carthage, he went with his own escort, friends who wanted to travel with him at a time of danger. I'm going like a lamb to the slaughter. I am calm as a summer's morning. I have a conscience void of offense towards God and towards all men, and I shall die an innocent man. Joseph, don't talk like that. You'll come back. The Lord will protect you. Sorry. Don't go, Daddy. I have to, dear Julia. When will you be back? I don't know. Look at your mother now.
Emma, teach them righteousness. Joseph, you're coming back. This time there would be no generous judge, no legal loophole, no triumphant return to Emma and his family, his farm, and his service to God. His enemies were not willing to wait for a trial, broker a settlement, or risk Joseph somehow resting from their grip. So they were all together in the jail on that somber afternoon when Hiram, it appears, is the one that said, John, sing us that song you brought back from England, Poor Wayfaring Man of Grief. Some thought killing Joseph would kill the church he led as well. Not so. The faithful finished the temple, but they never were granted peace. Less than three years after the martyrdom, 10,000 Mormons, men, women, and children, fled their country and their persecutors. They trekked west 1,300 miles to the Rocky Mountains and set about building Zion again. He lived great and he died great in the eyes of God and his people, and like most of the Lord's anointed in ancient times, has sealed his mission and his works with his own blood. John Taylor. I am bold to say that Jesus Christ accepted no better man ever lived or does live upon the earth. I feel like shouting hallelujah all the time when I think that I ever knew 
Joseph Smith, the prophet, Brigham Young. This program was made possible by the generous funding support of the Brent and Bonnie Jean Beasley Foundation, the Paul R. Willie Trust, the Joan and Tim Fenton Family Foundation, Bill and Rocille Lowe, Perry Holmes, Utah, the Stewart Charitable Foundations, the George S. and Dolores Dore Eccles Foundation, the Olds Family Trust, the Sorensen Legacy Foundation, and Garfield and Margot Cook.